Saludos amigos y amigas de Breaking News Bien Coffee, estamos un episodio más, un capítulo más Este que te habla Jorge Carramos Lugo, que estoy con Enrique Fernández y Arturo Ferrer Y hoy tenemos una invitada de lujo, de lujo, de lujo como les dije La próxima la invitada que tenemos ha sido Brewmaster, ha ganado premios en el JBF En el 2014 ganó un Achievement Award del Brewers Association y es, fue la fundadora del Pink Boot Society, Cherry Farendorf. Bienvenida. Hola, ¿cómo tú estás? Gracias por la invitación. Gracias. Thank you for accepting our invitation. How you doing? Hi, Terry. Hope you're doing all right. Thank you for... I'm doing great. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, we usually just start opening the beer, so... Oh. Yeah. Go, Can we... Go. Is this, do, can people watch this? Do they see what beers we have? For sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And that can is, it looks awesome. Yeah. I, lo I love the. Is it, my can is called Yes You Can. And it, I'm from Wisconsin and it's a beer uh, made for the Pink Boots Collaboration Brew Day in Wisconsin where I's from, I'm from. And my cousin sent me a four pack in the mail, yeah. which is great. I love this can. And I've been yeah. saving this beer for your podcast. Oh, yeah, thank awesome. you. Nice. <laughs> The art on nice. it is, uh, is, is great. Ooh, did we get that sound effect there? Yeah, oh, yeah. Got it. <laughs> nice, uh, crack. yeah. I'm going to have uh, Sophie. This one's a 2018 bottle, actually. And it's tasting awesome. So I'm going to go for that today. Yeah. We're going to have a, a Witty Fool from uh, Blackwater Drum here in Bryan, Texas. Uh, I am having one of the local breweries in Puerto Rico. Nice. This is Zork. Uh, this is a Hellas, a Hellas beer. That's a good one. So nice local Puerto Rican beer. But cheers. Cheers. Uh, we should just get right into it. Everybody got a brew. Uh, so Terry, you've had like a very impressive career overall in the brewing industry overall. Uh, how did you first, like, what was your first experience with beer? How did you get into the industry? Uh, was it a beer that you drank and you fell in love with, with craft beer? Or what was it that got your... Well, um, you could say I've been in this industry at, with a huge career because I've just refused to leave. I'm stubborn. I've been here a long time. So the longer you stay in an industry, the more points you rack up. I don't know. Just like playing in a video game, you just keep racking <laughs> up points. So, <laughs> so um, uh, I mean... My, some of my earliest beer memories, if you want to go way back, is um, certainly with my family, a uh, German-American family in Wisconsin, a very German-type state. Um, when we had family reunions uh, and a baby started crying, they'd give you a sip of beer. Of beer. <laughs> and, then, and then the baby takes a nap. Now they probably <laughs> call child protection services, but... Um, I'm pretty sure that's still happening in Wisconsin that the babies get a sip of beer. So I don't remember my very first beer. I do remember that beer was important to my family and we had pizza night about once a month and we got beer with pizza as kids. I remember going out for pizza once when I was 12 and I have three younger siblings and um, my father asked for a pitcher of beer and six glasses. And the waitress said, whoa, wait, there's only two adults. He said, either bring the kids each a glass or they're drinking out of ours. And <laughs> it's legal in Wisconsin. So um, I remember going to a church rummage sale when I was about nine years old and found a little booklet that, that said how beer is made. And I was so excited because I knew this was important to my family about beer. So I, I used up my allowance and bought that little booklet I'm sure it was from Miller Brewing Company and I brought it home and I was so excited to learn how beer was made and I opened it up and it was all about the big machines that beer factories had back then. And, and the big breweries still have these like mash presses and great big pieces of machinery. It never crossed my mind that you could homebrew. I mean, who would tell me that when I'm nine years old? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, uh, you know, um, Probably my first illegal beer with friends. I was 15. That was pretty common. Um, we could get away with it. They didn't card you for your identity and your age too often. I did have a baby face, so I looked 
pretty young, but we were sneaking into bars at 16. Um, the drinking age was 18. That kind of dates me, right? And um, not 21 back then. It's, it's so, still 18 in Puerto Rico, at least. Yeah, so we can know, relate to that timeline. Our, then Puerto Rico is the smartest state in the union. <laughs> I know you're not a state yet, but you're a state in my mind, or you're a state of mind. One of mm. the two, right? Like, cause <laughs> classic Commonwealth. We're still half and a half. Yeah. The great debate, but, but yeah, yeah. So I like that about Puerto Rico. Drinking yeah. is the Puerto, like Rico, the Puerto Rico the, uh, is the same thing that people start drinking very, very young. I think about, uh, 16, yeah, 15, 15 years 16 years old. Yeah. saying it's usually the, yeah. <laughs> the norm over here. For people sneak at 15 or 16 into mm -hmm. the pubs. And That's, well, then yeah. we can totally relate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your and family so, sounds like, they sound awesome. <laughs> We, we, so, we drank a lot of beer in college, too. I'm sure you guys do that, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we did a lot so, of that, for sure. So those are my, my beers. Um, the first beer that you could sort of call a craft beer, um, I was 21, and I had an Anchor Steam. Ooh, and nice. prior to that, all I had had was yellow, wimpy, little American lagers, because there was no craft beer industry back then. So I had an Anchor Steam beer from San Francisco, in San Francisco, and I thought it tasted like coffee, which is really <laughs> odd because if I had one now, I would never even taste the coffee. It would mm -hmm. be um, so subtle. But if compared to American light lagers, it definitely had some toasty types of flavors. And then um, in college, I started making homemade wine just as a hobby. And when I graduated from university, I moved to California and wine was pretty cheap, good wine. So I switched to making homemade beer. Um, I was the only woman in my homebrew club, a club called the San Andreas Malts out of San Francisco. And after three years of homebrewing, um, I really didn't like being a computer programmer, which was what I was. <laughs> and so um, I just, well, at that point, um, I attended the Great American Beer Festival and the American Homebrewers Conference that were combined at that time. And I met um, some people who had made the big jump from high tech into brewing and survived financially. And I saw a woman get up on stage and win a medal. And she was the first craft beer brewmaster in the modern era. And I thought, wow, she's about my size. If she can do it, I can do it. So just seeing these people that I could relate to being professional brewers, I that weekend decided to become a professional brewer. That was in 1988. And so I, um, I contacted the Siebel Institute in Chicago because there was only two choices, the Siebel Institute in Chicago or, or UC, University of California at Davis. But I didn't want to spend time on a master's degree. I just wanted to get the training I needed. And so I attended Siebel. And um, I was the first class president they ever had. I had a lot of firsts in my career. It was really pretty, pretty amazing. I, I'm... I mean, I'm so lucky and so blessed, um, but I, I've been around so long. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so, I'm so blessed that you guys invited me to come and talk on your show. I'm like a dinosaur almost. No, I mean, oh, that's no, no, of course, it's, it's, it's very, oh. it's very impressive. That what you were just talking about is one of your, like, one of the paragraphs I read in your, in your, in your bio, which is very impressive. That you, you say you've, you've been like fortunate to be at the right place at the right time. Oh, yeah. But I mean, the firsts in your career have been, even to this day, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's, it's great. I, if you want to go ahead and, and list them, that'd be because it's, it's very, it's very impressive. Um, oh, let's see <laughs> if they come up in conversation. I, I don't want to <laughs> like, here's my resume, you know, that yeah, I mean, <laughs> a little too weird. But you know, you guys seem like a chatty bunch, and I'm thinking if we just start talking about beer and riffing on beer ideas, um, stuff will come up, you know? Sure. So, uh, it, so um, at any rate, so, so let's see. Um, you know, something I'm proud of, I would say, is the Pink Boot Society, which I hope we'll cover in this. Are we, do we have a whole hour, or how long do we have? I mean, I can talk for three hours if you want, <laughs> but I'm going to need to get another beer at some point. Yeah, we usually do 45, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. But, well, we'll but talk yeah, about... no, we, we can talk for however much you want. It's, it's, do you, no, guys, do no... you guys edit this or is it live? We, we, we can edit it. Oh, we edit it. Yeah, we edit it. Oh, okay. 
Because it's live. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we could use that anyways, but, but yeah, yeah. We, usually, okay. we usually add a couple of things. So, yeah. um, so I'm really proud of the Pink Boots Society. Um, I was uh, the third U.S. Brew, um, brewmaster since Prohibition, the third one. And of those three, I was the first one that was an employee and not an owner. So I was actually the first woman brewmaster that went out and beat the pavement and got that job. Oh, so that's that's kind of cool. Yeah. And, and, and I like being a role model because there were mo role models for me, as I mentioned, like that woman who got a, a medal. Her name's Melly Pullman. Um, she was the first U.S. craft brewmaster since Prohibition, and she was an owner at the time. She lives in Portland, Oregon, where I live right now and she is a professor of supply chain um, management at the business school at Portland State University, which is pretty cool. We run into each other at beer things now and then. And then the second one was Carol Stout of Stout Brewing in yep. Pennsylvania. And then I was the third. And um, you know, a lot of people forgot Melly for a long time because she only stayed in it for a couple of years. But people say, you're the second one or they'd say, you're the first. And I'm like, no. I want to honor the pioneers that came before me because, you know, I live in the American West and we have the whole, you know, uh, uh, theme and the, uh, the storyline of the pioneers that moved West as, our, as the United States grew. And a lot of those first pioneers got shot and nobody remembered them. <laughs> and so you know, I'm the third Tough one. <laughs> I didn't, I'm the third one. I didn't get shot, but I'm going to help the world remember the ones that came before me. Yes, that's, that's like a, a couple of the firsts uh, that we were talking about are like you were the first brewmaster, woman brewmaster in California and in Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, which are two Correct. really big states. <laughs> that's true. Beer in general. So <laughs> well, I'm the first west of the west of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> so the, like that in itself to be the first one in a, in a state is, is awesome. But being those two specific states, uh, Oregon and California are like, you know, there's still, I don't even know how many breweries are in California, but it's uh, like a thousand or more. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, that, that's awesome. That's, it's, it's crazy. Thanks. Great. Ter cool. Terry, <laughs> when did you decide to uh, found the uh, Pink Boot Society? Okay, that's a great story. Um, and, and you'll notice this about me is that if you ask me a question, I will answer it in a really long way. And if I get off track, I always circle back. So um, that story, I had been working for Steelhead Brewing Company as their brewmaster for 17 years. And at that point, I'd been a brewmaster for a total of 19 years in my career. This was uh, 2007. And, um, you know, you work at a place for 17 years and you just feel like there's nothing new you can learn. There's nothing really else you could do. And it's time to move on. You mm -hmm. know, it's just time to go. But I, I wasn't ready to fall in love with another brewery yet. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> I just know it's, it's, it's time to move on. And so... Um, I had always had this idea in my head, wouldn't it be fun to go and visit all of my brewing peers, all my friends that I knew in the industry and visit them and brew with them? Because I would run into them at beer festivals and at conferences, and I would often taste their beers at these festivals. And um, your beers, when you're a brewmaster, your beers are your children. So the question mm -hmm. is, are your children behaving when they're away from home or are they not? And so, um, you know, only the brewmaster knows for sure. But if you go visit these beers at their brewery, then you can really get a sense of, of you know, your friend and how they're brewing and just spend the day with them. And this is before everybody got so crazy with collabs. Um, so I told my husband about this idea and he said, that's an awesome idea and you should do that. So once I quit, well, first after I quit, and as I said, I'll get to that that pink boots thing. Anyway, when I first quit, I had an identity crisis and I thought, oh my God, I'm not a brewmaster anymore. I'm nobody. And I'm going to go on this big trip and I'm going to visit all these friends and everything. And I thought, I need a title. So I gave myself the title road brewer, like a brewer that's on the road. And I went and got roadbrewer.com. And, and my friends were saying, you have to send email updates because you're doing my fantasy trip 
And I said, I can't send all of you email updates. I'll tell you what. I said, I'll start a blog. I don't know how, but I'll, I'll figure it out. So if you go to roadbrewer.com, you'll find my blog for my 139 day road trip across the United States and back. And mm -hmm. I believe I visited about 73, 81, I can't remember. Anyway, about 73 breweries and I brewed at 38 of them and I distilled to three distilleries. And I visited all my brewing friends that I had been talking about. And a lot of my relatives, my aunts and uncles were getting very old in their 70s and 80s. And so on the weekends, I would visit my aunts and uncles. And I was really glad because for some of them, it was the last time I got to see them. So it was family on weekends, all these breweries during the week. And sometimes, I mean, this is back when there were only 1,000 breweries in the United States. Okay. Now there's like 10,000. Mm -hmm. So 2007, that's only 13 years ago, but this, the sheer volume and number of breweries has grown exponentially. So there were spots where I didn't have any place to visit. And there certainly were, I didn't know of any women, <laughs> you know, this is where Pink Boot Society got to start. So, um, so I put out there in, in internet land in the Brewers Forum, hey, I'm going on this trip. If you want me to come visit you, uh, be sure to drop me a line and ask, and I will try to connect the dots. So I did. And so I'm visiting my brewing friends and other breweries that I don't know anyone. And I would get there and they'd say, I'd say, hi, I'm here to brew with you guys today. And they're like, oh, you're brewing with Laura today. Or you're brewing with Whitney. Or you're brewing with Dee Dee or Judy. And, um, and I'm like, who are these women? I didn't know them. I had never heard of them, these women brewers. And they had never heard of me, even though I had been a brewmaster for 19 years at that point. So I, I met with them, Laura Ulrich from Stone Brewing, who is now the president of Pink Boots Society. Um, she was my first one. And she was, she was like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only woman brewer in the world. And now I met you and you've been a brewmaster and you've made this amazing career. I just thought I had a cool job, but look at you've done, been a brewmaster for 19 years. She said, what are you doing for dinner tonight? I said, well, I'm unemployed and I'm having a granola bar and I'm parked in my camper in your parking lot. That's <laughs> <Wow>. my plans. <laughs> and she said, no, no, I'm going to buy you dinner. Um, at the Stone Brewing Bistro. I said, okay. And so she, it was really clear that she wanted other women to connect with, that she had felt very lonely in her career. And my maternal instincts, I guess, came out and I just really felt like I wanted to mentor her. And so this story repeated itself across the United States where different women, it was really clear that they needed to connect. So one of the questions Laura asked me is, wow, Terry, you tell me we're not the only two out there. How many women brewers are they there? And I said, I don't know, I'm going on this road trip, so I'll start collecting the names. So I started collecting the names and I got out to the East Coast and I met another woman named Whit Whitney. She had the same question. Wow, I thought we were the only ones, or she thought she was the only one. How many of us are there? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I've got this list. Uh, I said, tell you what, I said, there's 60 women on the list because I was so glad I had an answer. She goes, who are they? I want to network. I want to connect. And I thought, oh, bingo. That's where this is going. So I said, tell you what, I will put this on my website. By then I had started my website, terryfarendorf.com, because I had met all these, well, I met some very experienced brewers that I was learning from. And I met some less experienced brewers that I was helping and I would say, oh, you need my grain handling article I wrote in 1993 or whatever. And so I needed a place to put it so they could get it. So I built this website and, I, and I'm putting this list of names together, all these women brewers. And I thought, well, I could just call it list of women brewers, but that's so boring. And, and here I have my new name, the road brewer. I said, it needs a name. And so I thought, well, there's the, the Red Hat Society. Those are the little old ladies that wear the red and purple hats that like to party. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm wearing these pink boots, which by the way, I had worn black boots my entire career. And then when I was gonna be going on this trip, I mentioned to my husband that I said, man, I'm gonna be walking into these breweries and I'm gonna be the first woman they've ever seen. And as soon as I open my mouth and start talking beer lingo, I'm gonna be one of the boys, which is the usual thing. And I thought, I said, you know, pink is kind of the ubiquitous female color these days. Although I'll tell you, in ancient Rome, 
the warriors dressed their sons in pink because pink was called light red and it was the warrior's color. Mm. So pink is a warrior color. Remember <laughs> that. So at any rate, so he told his mom and my mother-in-law sent me these pink boots. So I was wearing these boots on this trip, even though the first day I wore them, I thought they were so flashy. I put on my black boots, but the brewers I visited that day said, where are your pink boots? In my camper, they said, go and put them on. So I did. <laughs> so I wore the pink boots the whole trip at that point. So I named it the Pink Boot Society after my boots and then the Red Hat Society. And that's how it got its name. I didn't think too hard about it. And I just put that list of names up online. And then it was like putting up a lightning rod and it attracted lightning. It was amazing. I started getting emails. Hi, I am um, the packaging manager at Bell's Brewing Company and I'm a woman, can I join? I didn't know it was something you could join. I just thought it was a list. Hi, I am the, um, I'm the, the uh, lab technician at Ska Brewing. I mean, these are actual people who contacted me. Can I join? I don't know, but I'll keep your name. Then I started getting emails from guys. Oh my gosh, I have a beer blog. This is the coolest thing ever. I'm going to link to your post or I'm going to relist your names or I have a daughter and I'm so excited about this whole idea of women brewers. I didn't know there were any. So it was just like a lightning rod that attracted attention. So I went on my trip and um, I started this list and um, oh, it was generating this interest. I got home from my trip. We moved from Eugene, Oregon to Portland, Oregon. And I'm trying to like reach out to, I'd hear a rumor, hi, there's a woman brewer in Belgium. She's a nun. Oh, Schwester Doris. All right, Sister Doris. Um, there's one in Bloomington, Indiana. Okay, I get to Indiana on my trip. Is there a woman brewer in this state? Oh uh, yeah, I think so. She's in Bloomington. Do you know her name? No. I just kept tracking down the clues, trying to find all the women brewers I could find to put on this, this list. And then it ended up being about February of 2008. And I realized that the Craft Brewers Conference was going to be in San Diego where Laura Ulrich, the first woman that I met lived. And I called her and I said, Laura, the CBC is going to be in San Diego. Should we try to get the women on this list together just to meet each other? We never met uh, most of us, and she, except for me and a couple of them. She said, Let, yeah, let's do that. I said, okay. Um, so we put together uh, uh, an invite. We had this beautiful little luncheon. Laura arranged for like pink tablecloths and some flowers on the tables. And all the ladies brought their beers and we're opening beers and tasting them. And chat, 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 chat. We were so excited to meet each other. And it's funny because before the event, I put the word out so that any women brewers could attend. And um, the male uh, beer writers and journalists contacted me like uh, Tom Daldor from the California Celebrator and said, can I come and cover your meeting? Um, it's really newsworthy. We don't know of any groups of women brewers that have ever met anywhere in the world. And I said, I've never heard of it either. But I said, no, you can't come. Send a woman. I said, we don't know what a room full of estrogen only feels like. And we have to, know, we have to figure that out. And so no testosterone in that first meeting, sorry. Um, and it was really fun. We just enjoyed each other so much. Um, I learned from Pink Boot Society over, over the years that I have kind of a very direct communication style, which can, is considered a male communication pattern. Whereas women, instead of making statements, tend to ask more questions. And I've had to learn how to change my talk so that I can communicate better with women, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, just to give an example of how that works, let's say there's three brewers standing in a circle trying each other's India pale ales, and they're all men. And the first one asks the second one, hey, what? how many IBUs did you use in this beer? And they give a number. And then the other guy goes, well, you know, one guy says 80 IBU, the other one goes, well, mine is 90 IBU. And the next guy goes, well, mine is 100 IBU. So it's like this testosterone driven hop one upmanship. Uh, whereas the same questions with women, with brewers, with their beers, First one asks, how many IBU in your IPA here? And the one says, 80 IBU. The second one says, well, how do you think that worked for you? Would you do it differently next time? Completely different conversations mm -hmm. men and women right. are having in the beer industry. 
But see, women have been trying to keep up with the men's conversation for a long time and not feeling like they can get a word in because they want to ask questions and have questions asked back. And so now, you know, they have a place that they can go and have the communication style they want and discuss beer the way they want to discuss beer. Not that there's anything wrong with the way guys discuss beer, it's just different. And then women can easily go and have a discussion with men on, you know, beer. But now that there are actually Pink Boot Society meetings and we have a conference every two years, I mean, it's insane how cool it is and how much it's grown. Men can attend our Pink Boot Society conference. And, um, you know, we're not saying nobody, men can't come. Um, you, you can't really join as a member, but, but you can come to the conference and learn. I mean, we want everybody to learn. And all the instructors, whatever, all the speakers at the Pink Boot Society conference are all Pink Boot Society members. They're all women. Wow. So it's pretty cool. And um, we had one guy come to our last conference. He kind of sat in the back. I think he was like maybe a little embarrassed to be there. I don't know. But everybody he was probably just came. intimidated, not embarrassed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because <laughs> he was, it must have been like, well, everyone, all the women were coming up saying, hey, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. They were really polite to him and everything. And uh, I asked him, what made you decide to attend? You, you know, I said, we're happy you're here, but what made you decide to attend? He goes, it's close to my home and it's cheaper than the craft brewers conference. And he said, <laughs> he said quite frankly, I've been to a craft brewers conference and the quality of the programming here so far is better than wow. the last CBC I attended. And I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you probably learned a ton of it. And I mean, this whole story about the, the road brewer, the, this huge it's trip that you did, it sounds like, yeah, basically like the first Gypsy brewer in history. <laughs> Gypsy brewer. <laughs> sounds like you must have learned a lot even even for somebody with 19 years yeah. oh i did already as a pro brewer you I get did. to see the process of so many other yeah people i'm guessing it must have been yeah uh, it must have been insane uh, the amount of info that you're absorbing and it it was fun it, i'll tell you some people <clears throat> ask me funny questions like did you see the grand canyon i said i didn't <laughs> have time to go sightseeing i said i get up in the morning and I'd brew with whatever brewery I'm parked in their parking lot. Then I'd, I, I'd cross my fingers and hope they buy me lunch if they're a brew pub because I'm unemployed. Then in the afternoon, I'd use their Wi-Fi and I'd blog on my blog. Then, I, then I'd get in my camper and my van and I would drive to the next one. And I'd try to arrive before dinner, hoping they'll buy me dinner because I'm unemployed. And then I'd <laughs> sleep in their parking lot. And the next morning, I'd get up and do it again. So... Um, it, it was it was work. I mean, but it was awesome work. And, and I met so way, many this, people. This sounds like the greatest yeah. pitch ever for like a Discovery Channel or History Channel. Yeah. Yo, yeah. yeah, they have I to mean, make a, be, a program. Something yeah, like that. Be, that would have yeah. been awesome. People were telling me you should write a book. Of course, now it would be really yeah. out of date. And um, but but the thing is, is like I came back and I worked on Pink Boots and then I got a job. And um, I guess... Um, I'm Aquarian, so I'm always thinking ahead, you know, and I'm like, I can't go back and, and build the whole thing. But I think I was the first, like, serious beer-centric road trip. I mean, I was on the road for almost five months visiting all these breweries and brewing with them. And, and brewers have done that since then, but I believe I was, that was a first, too. I mean, you can go out there and make up your own first, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a dream trip, honestly, for any beer fan. Apart from the brewing part, which is like you said, it's a very physical and like demanding. Yeah. Like people think like, oh, it's so great to, until they <laughs> do it once and they're like, oh mm -hmm. my god, you really have to like it. To. Even home brewers, you spend like ninety percent of the time cleaning stuff and moving stuff, and so definitely yeah. must yeah. have been really hard work. It's funny because I I just put it out there and people would be like. Googling, Google searching for like a brewery or something and they would find my blog. They're still finding my blog. And then they, they, they became like my regular readers. And if I didn't write anything for a couple of days, they'd be like <laughs> e emailing me. Are you okay? What happened? Where are you? You haven't written anything in three days. They're like, this is how I get up every morning. I just jump on and see what you did yesterday. People were so excited to read that thing live while I was on that trip. 
And then now you can go and read it and hopefully be inspired to, to do your own road trip, right? I mean- I would love to do that. To, to, to do that. I'm gonna quit my job and do it. <laughs> that, that I, that's what I had to do. I had to quit my job, yeah. Well, and you know, someday when I retire, I have all these contacts through Pink Food Society now. I wanna like go out and like road trip and visit all these women that are in the beer industry and visit them and do collaborations with them and stuff. And obviously I'm gonna to get to Puerto Rico sometime. Um, yeah, I, have a friend, I have a friend there, shout out to Tommy Noonan, if he's listening in Puerto Rico. I don't know if you guys know it, but he's a partner in a brewery in Vermont still, but he lives nice. in Puerto Rico. Which I is didn't know that. He's I haven't met Tommy yet. You haven't met Tommy Noonan? He's a good guy and he knows his beer too. So that's awesome. Is he I working here in, in some uh in, in, in any of the like any beer? I'm sure he's working, but I never asked him. I know he likes to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> it's a full time job, then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I don't I don't remember where he's working. I don't remember. I'm I'm sure he told me once, but I forgot. Um, but he's out there on Facebook. I told him about your your uh, blog, so hopefully he'll. Nice. He'll, the craft beer scene here is. Pardon me. Yeah. Craft beer scene here is. What 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 did you? I didn't I didn't hear. I didn't understand. Arturo, I didn't hear you. I think yeah. you said something. Ah, okay, no. Uh, I, I think I got a glitch. I have a bad Wi-Fi <laughs> here. You <laughs> jump around. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you something. Uh, how did you compare the brewing industry when you started with what is today? Is there some difference, right? I would say yes. Um, let me give you some stories to illustrate what it was yeah. like when I was I love, first I love trying stories. to get a job. I okay. love stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of stories. I'm full of something. Anyway, so, um, so when I was first trying to get a job, um, I, I was... I was a, a home brewer, as I said, and it's interesting, the San Andreas Malts, which is named after the San Andreas Fault yeah. in California, um, that was the homebrew club in San Francisco. And about 10 of us went professional all about the same time. The rest were all guys and they just went out and got jobs. But I knew five foot five, 120 pounds, you know, I'm not gonna be getting that job as easy as them because a lot of the owners were just looking for strong guys to lift bags of grain. So that's why I went to the Siebel Institute in Chicago. And so I'm looking for a job. And it's funny because people keep asking physical questions. These are men owners that are interviewing me or men managers. And in my opinion, those kinds of questions are smarter now. So let's illustrate what those questions were, right? <laughs> so one guy says, uh, can you lift this 55 pound bag of grain over your head into the middle that's way up here, right? And I said, no, but, I always say no, but. No, but I would get some cinder blocks and some boards and I would build some steps and the mill isn't that fast anyway. I would empty that 55 gallon bag into two five gallon buckets. I would make two trips and it would not slow me down. I could mill in the same amount of time as someone else. And they go, oh, okay. I had a, a guy who asked me over the phone, I, you know, before he would even interview me in person. He said, um, he said, can you carry a full half barrel up a flight of steps? I said, that weighs over 160 pounds. I said, nobody should be carrying a full half barrel up a flight yeah. of steps. He goes, can you do it? I said, no, but. I said, what I would do is I would either set up a bo some boards to be a slide and I get a winch at the top and I get some netting and I would winch that keg up to the top of the steps or I would get a hand truck and I would bump, 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 <laughs> bump it up the steps slowly. I said, but, but nobody should be doing that. He said, um, he said, well, uh, all of our brewers are required to carry a half barrel up a flight of steps. So if you can't do that, there's no sense in me interviewing you. Oh, wow. And I said, oh. That sounds like a case of uh, having to redesign something in a place instead yeah, of uh, yeah. asking somebody. Yeah. Well, what's funny is that guy became a very good friend. In fact, a lot of the guys that ask these really silly questions <laughs> have since become excellent friends of mine and they don't remember those questions. <laughs> and and if, if I reminded them, they would be mortified, I'm sure, right? So, um, so that guy, um, 
when I ended up two jobs later, I was in Eugene, Oregon, and he was in Oregon, and he he was a regional brewmaster going to visit the brewers at each of the, his sites, each of their little brewery sites, and so um, he called these. I, I think I contacted him and said, hey, just so you know, I, I'm working in Eugene. I'm setting up this brewery there called Steelhead. And, and so he called me back at some point and said, hey, I'm going to be in town. I said, why don't you come over? We're not open yet, but I'll let you taste all the beers. And so he and his brewer came over and he goes, and I got this all the time at the beginning of my career. Wow, wow, these beers are good. I'm like, what did you expect? <laughs> I don't know what people expected, but apparently good was not one of the vocabulary words they were thinking of. So, um, so those are some of the silly questions. So now what I tell people, and I believe this is happening more and more often, and that is that a, think of people my age that are guys. Now I never just muscled the bags up because remember I was using my brain over my brawn. And so I have a perfectly good back. I have really good knees. A lot of guy brewers, when they were young, were doing the muscle thing, and now they have semi-broken bodies. They're yeah. messed up, right? You're, you know, so, harder, not harder, so. Yeah, so what I tell people is that if you build a safe brewery that a guy, a brewer, over the age of 50 can brew at, I said, then any woman can brew there too, and it is a safe brewery. So if you're not sure if your brewery is a safe brewery, find a woman brewer and say, will you come in and do a safety audit here and work with my brewer for a whole day? And then she will, because we have to be clever as women because we're not as strong. So we have to be clever. So she will figure out a way to make your brewery safe enough for any old brewer with bad knees and a bad back can work in safely and not hurt themselves. And, and everybody will be happier. You're not gonna have injuries on site. Uh, the Occupational Safety and Hazard Associate, whatever, OSHA, whatever they're mm -hmm. called, um, they will be happy. And, and so, you know, if you're not sure if your brewery is safe, get an old guy or any woman brewer to come in <laughs> and do a yeah. safety audit and you'll end up with a safer brewery. That sounds like a, like a great job. Too. Yeah. He just came up with a, with a new position for it's, Probably it someone it's, in Puerto Rico should should open a consultancy, uh, you know, an old broken brewer maybe, <laughs> yeah. and just say, you know, I can't do the heavy lifting anymore, but I'm a safety consultant now, and um, I will do a safety audit in your brewery for a fee, you know, a thousand dollars a day. It's worth that for an entire day, because you know, one workman's comp insurance claim is going to cost you way yeah. more than mm -hmm. that thousand dollars of course even the and people the people working there are gonna everybody's gonna benefit from it everybody's everybody yeah the, the brewery the, the employees everyone yeah 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 it's a, it's a fascinating thing you know like uh open a new spectrum of beyond the the the, the brewery as a safe place because uh it's, it's a demanding job it's like uh mm -hmm very physical but you have to 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 use your your brain to, to to do the work most efficiently and don't break your back or don't break your knees yeah <laughs> exactly like a lot of other things that people have just been doing it that way for so long that they never stop and think like wait can we make this better like in general not just yeah it's just safer and, and healthier yeah for sure right is there a brewer's guild in puerto rico we we yeah. had uh, a home brewers association. It's been pretty quiet lately, but yeah, mm -hmm. the the home brewing, the craft beer scene in general, isn't huge here. I, how many how many breweries would you say? Uh, maybe eight. Yeah. Something like that. Eight. Some, I, is it eight or I think it's a little I don't bit, know. probably yeah. like twelve, yeah. like twelve, 12 small 12 breweries, calls? and and one big one basically. But someone so uh, the. All, all, all the breweries are little ones. The biggest one is a, f a 15 barrel. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's wow. an exciting start though. That's, that's an yeah. exciting start. And then <laughs> that's the one, yeah. That's, that's, that, that's, that's, the that's probably yeah. the, I would say the second or third biggest brewery. The second, on the, Ocean the, second the, the, the biggest one is, uh, is the front, the Sierra Puerto Rico. Yeah, out of, the, out of the small ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because service. But, but, 
I think is like uh, the the most the biggest is the cervecera. The second one is, is like uh, fifteen bottles, something like that. Yeah, it goes like. Yeah, uh, it's, it's fuck. I I think fuck yeah, have yeah. a ten, right, or something like that. Or they, harbor. They have like an. Or seven, harbor, uh, like... but then it's like a from from ten it goes down to five, and from five it goes down to one. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very, it's like, a very, very big jumps, and the really big one has I don't know what they're doing, probably like fifty barrel batches. <laughs> but it, it's a I don't know if you've heard of Medalla. It's probably the, it, it is the most popular, the biggest one, yeah. Okay. The American light lager style, mm -hmm. uh, the the big one, the big macro brewery on. The, yeah, it's the big macro from here, yeah. Yeah. from Puerto Rico, yeah. But yeah, the difference in size is is crazy compared to the to the ones that are brewing craft on the island. How many, what's the population of Puerto Rico? Is Maybe 3.5 or something million, like that. Yeah. 3.5 uh, million? Yep. Yeah. Around that, yeah. yeah around oh, that. You've, you've got room for a few more breweries there. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You recently we decreased the, the tax uh, per gallon here. Recently passed a law for that. They, and it was crazy. It was like four something per gallon. And oh. if you had like a special permit, they let you pay two something per gallon. Two fifty two. But now it, it went to uh, I think ninety six cents a gallon, and it's it's still pretty you know still high. pretty high. But one of the points that they were you know highlighting in in all these trying to get this law passed is like we have so much room for for growth here in the industry. That's you know the government's pretty hard headed when when it comes to, yeah. to that specific. Uh, uh point but you know yeah we, we could be like a freaking mecca of the caribbean here for for brewing, yeah. brewing trips <laughs> now with yeah. this covid thing it's it's hard for, mm -hmm. it's for hard. any place but it's you know right generally yeah i think we, we definitely have a lot of room for for growth yeah we are, yeah the thing is that we are we are an island right and um, when the beer comes comes from maybe the, USA is the biggest uh, uh, exporter, and we import basically everything from 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 the US. And uh, when the beer comes here, it it, it doesn't come very fresh. And uh, you are you are not drinking mm -hmm. the fresh the the fresh beer. Uh, that's the, I think that's that's the one reason that we need more breweries. Uh, we need to drink more fresh beer. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. people enjoy the beer because if you try one beer that have been and and the and the in the states they go back from here and they have to stay i don't know how many weeks in the docks um to have a permit and then they go out and then it's it's gonna be like a two or three months or or, or maybe one month I, yeah, so just, it's gonna, they're drinking, it's gonna, they're drinking all beer. Better, but sometimes it's a shame when you get like yeah. a, you, you find out a pretty fresh batch, like a two or three week old batch gets the docks. And then yeah. by the time the, the tax people here, Hacienda, release the, the container or whatever, it's been like two more weeks. And then you're like, mm -hmm. it's not terrible. I mean, you're drinking, a, I don't know, an IPA with a month on it, a month and a half. Yeah. But huh. It's, you know, you could have had it with, Two or three weeks on it, which is uh, that's always that sucks when that happens. That's yeah. a shame. That's a shame because it is. Every, every brewery have to to work hard to make their product the the very best, and you can enjoy it. The yeah, way and you have to import. Yeah. you have to import your barley in your yeah, hops, yeah, your malted yeah. barley in your hops too, which is yeah. expensive. It's expensive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's also yeah. that can like mixed with the super huge. Uh, tax per, per gallon thing was like crazy you know you ended up paying more for the for tax than than even the ingredients sometimes but but yeah the ingredients themselves are pretty expensive over here yeah, yeah. everything everything in, a, in an island in an island is it, very expensive the electricity right. here is very is very expensive too um everything in island is, is expensive but but we are working out to make a uh, new breweries uh i wanna i gotta I wanna, I wanna be part of that uh, a theme of breweries, but it's kind of expensive. Like, uh, I wanna 
make a brewery, but you make the numbers and you wow, man, I, I don't you know. You have to love what you're yeah. doing. The, you know, if you guys could get them to reduce the excise taxes, I mean, Oregon did so well. I mean, there's over a hundred breweries in the Portland, you know, metro area where I live. And that's not just the whole state. I mean, the st state is several hundred. Yeah. But part of that is because Oregon's excise, state excise tax was $2.60 per 31 gallons. Wow. Oh, that wow. was state. And then federal was seven dollars per thirty-one gallons, and that just got reduced to three dollars and fifty cents wow. federal. And and you guys, if you guys pay federal, your federal should only be three dollars and fifty cents per thirty-one bar gallon barrel now. Um, but it, it makes all the difference when when you can, you know, reduce the tax burden because that you could put that money into more tanks. Yeah, yeah. That makes a big deal. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because yeah, um, I mean, you can't really get past that until, till, till there's some kind of margin because the playing field does not level for small breweries. Um, you know, the big guys have economies of scale. They can bring in big cargo containers full of grain and hops, and the little guys are just looking for a local distributor. I mean, they're they're a step above home brewing because they're buying a 44 pound box of hops instead of five ounces or six ounces or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but still, they're not buying a cargo trailer, you know, cargo load full of hops. Yeah, and especially trying to brew these more, you know, modern style types of beers, you know, extra <laughs> hoppy IPAs. And yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't uh, I have, the IPAs are expensive beer. <laughs> For sure. I mean, yeah. yeah, and double what IPAs are more expensive. <laughs> yeah, uh, compared to, to the to the macro lager type of thing, it's uh I'm not dissing any of those beers, but it's definitely like uh it's gonna be you know it's gonna be cheaper the recipe itself compared to these like super extra hazy hoppy. Oh things. yeah, oh yeah. I mean, not only are the ingredients expensive, they're using a lot more of those ingredients. Therefore, they need to have a a, a tax reduction compared to the major importers. I mean, it, if, if your locals are gonna just go buy Budweiser super cheap, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, it better be taxed heavier than the local guys. Right. The local yeah. guys should, should pay way less in excise taxes than anything that comes in on a boat. Mm -hmm. And that all comes down to, you know, I think educating the, the community, the beer drinkers, because even the super, like the fans of really good beer, sometimes they don't really understand that, you know, this hazy, hazy IPA costs like 10 times what yeah. Oh, yeah. With the lager next yeah. to it on the tap next to it. So some people are like, why is this, why are you charging me, you know, eight bucks for this glass? This beer, yeah. Yeah. Five yeah, like, so people, people don't understand. Yeah. yeah. The That's why you guys are here. here. Yeah. That's why you're here. Cause mm -hmm. you're helping to educate the beer drinking public. That's right. And, and I mean, Good beer is great for a reason, and it's worth what you have to pay for it. No one in Puerto Rico is getting rich off of beer. No. You know, they're just trying to fulfill their heart's desire and give you something creative that, that they've made with their own hands. And they're proud and excited about it, and they want you to be proud and excited about it. And someday, when Puerto Rico has 50 or 100 breweries, you guys are going to be developing new Puerto Rican styles of beer, but there's not enough mass of breweries yet to get to that point. But yeah. there will be unique local things. Maybe you grow a lot of citrus and somebody says, instead of using hops for bittering, I'm going to use citrus pith because I can boil that and get a nice bittering. And then I'll save all my aroma hops for some hop bursting at the end. And mm. then people are like, oh my gosh, this is such a, a unique flavor of bitterness in this beer. Well, it's a citrus pith bitterness and it's all about Puerto Rico and what's local. Mm -hmm. I think you guys have a lot of potential. I really think you do. Terry yeah, Fandor sure. for precedent. Yeah. <laughs> the, greatest, <laughs> the greatest way of explaining it I've ever heard. We need more people like you in the- Yeah. Well, when I come to Puerto Rico someday, I'm calling you guys and you of, guys- Of can, course, yeah. You guys we, can give me a tour of the brewery. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Be more than happy to. It's that like, uh, it's a, we're, we're so small. Yeah, we can go, one day we can go to all the lures, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, but let's let's like let's like dream big. Let's say that five years from now you have ten times the number of breweries. Mm. You know, let's dream. Let's dream. How many let's people are, are are like uh opening the breweries? Like uh opening nano breweries, yeah, uh, one bottle, two bottles, uh, breweries. Right. But yeah. but it's a, it's just a, it's a great thing, you know. But mm -hmm. if we can come up with a plan that we can make, I don't know, maybe a uh, a society that we can come around and pay for for a large amount of grains, a, la mm -hmm. a large amount of, and we can get a community and um, buy big, and then everyone gets their lot that of grains. That, that would be awesome. That's that's your professional brewers guild. Yeah. And you guys have, let's say, eight breweries, you said now? About? Like a 12. Probably around 12. 12. 12. Yeah. Okay. Up to 12, yeah. That's enough. Uh, the Oregon Brewers Guild was the first brewers guild in the United States. And we started when there was about 12 breweries in the state. I worked for Steelhead Brewing Company. We were the 10th brewery in the state of Oregon. And when they had their first meeting, uh, my owners didn't go because my owner is a restaurateur and didn't really care. But I, as a brewer, <laughs> I cared. And yeah. I was the only non-owner there. And I was the first treasurer, you know, but, but um, you know, uh, the owners, if they're passionate about beer, they, they need to form a guild and, um, you know, find out what you need. Um, I would say contact some of the guilds in the United States or the American, what is it called? Uh, the Brewers Association out of Fort Collins, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. and, and they could just contact them and say, send us some, some sample bylaws. You just, I mean, there's just legal things to become an entity that you have to cover. So, so you know, get some lawyers to pro bono, which means for free, pro bono the work, um, you know, get some some examples. And even if you don't know what to do with the Brewers Guild, you start with that. And just like, I didn't know what to do with Pink Boot Society, but once you name it, it becomes yeah. a lightning rod and like the sun shines on it. So if the professional brewers, and here's what Oregon did too, which is cool. They had um, supporter of native Oregon beer, snob, right? <laughs> Get it? Beer snob. And so they had beer snob t-shirts, supportive of native Oregon beer. And they sold those just to regular beer consumers for $25 to help raise money. You get a t-shirt and like a coupon for a couple of free pints of beer at a local, local uh, brewery. And so, um, you know, there's ways to raise money. And because uh, it does cost money to like, especially if you need to go to the legislature with the lobbyists and petition for lower ex excise taxes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Puerto Rico, I don't know if this is a good thing to say, but I think you guys have been our 51st state for about 50 <laughs> years. For about 50 years. I mean, it's nuts that you're not. And, uh, and if that's an unhappy thing I just said, I apologize. But, no, it's but, okay. I mean, I mean, I'm proud of having Puerto Rico as a state. And I love, I mean, look at your flag. It's Captain America. <laughs> 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 <That's> the, <laughs> it is. For sure. There's a lot of jokes, uh, a lot of memes on the island of, uh, you know, Captain Puerto Rico because it's, yeah. it's literally, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so I think that, um, Someday, for God's sakes, I hope it happens. And, uh, you know, people forget that you guys are down there. But, you know, it's not just Hawaii that's an island state. We got another island state. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty special. And they have a, a native culture, Puerto Rican culture, just like Hawaii has a Hawaiian yeah. culture. You know, we just got to get more um, connected so that people are understand that it's a part of the United States. And then after you guys are state, maybe we'll go get Guam or something. They're a territory too. <laughs> <laughs> so you I, mean, I mean, it's not fair to you guys to not be able to vote in presidential elections and things like that. I agree, yeah. It's yeah. way, way not fair. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because that, you know, that sets the agenda for a lot of what happens 
everywhere in the U.S. and its territories. So it's not fair to you. Right. Yeah. I think we're just so used to it by now. We, I don't even think of, about that anymore. But, but definitely, it's. <laughs> oh, come it's on. Good. Let's go protest. It's happening everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but let's protest peacefully. I like yeah. it peaceful. Yeah. That way, I, I hope, the, I hope all, all of the local breweries listen to this uh yeah. to this episode and because a lot of the stuff you said is uh terrific you know terrific ideas mm -hmm. i hope they yeah, the majority of the people that are opening the breweries are home brewers oh uh, yeah yeah that's how like, it starts uh, yeah and and the, they they make this sacrifice to 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 make his the, the dreams you know it's like a it's a big step you know it's it's kind of Cost you money, but people do it anyway. It's like uh, if I only live once in my life, I have I only one one life. It's like uh, mm. I gonna do it. it. It's like your road trip. I would really love to 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 make that road trip. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's yeah. It's just like a, something special. Yeah, you only have one life. Uh, you have to live it the way that you want. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, why not? Yep. And when you're young, your choices are this wide. And as you get older, they narrow. So if you're 75 years old, you're probably not going to open that brewery. But if you're 35, that choice is still there. Yeah. You know, even if you're 50, that choice is still yeah, there. Yeah, or maybe, maybe if, you're, if you want to open, you're not going to carry the, the, the bag of, 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 of grain. You're going to be there sampling or making the, the decision. But it's your brewery. It's like uh, you have. Uh, uh, I, I think that we have the energy to do that. That, that kind of, of work. At fifty, in fifty, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, and and I, you know, tap tap into people that have like restaurant skills and things like that. I mean, Tommy Noonan, as I mentioned, definitely does. But there's 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 a lot of skilled people in Puerto Rico, and I think that. If they just made the right connections, you know, with, with the people who were home brewing, who were ready to go pro, I mean, any res restaurateur could run a brew pub. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a restaurant first. That's the business model. You know, the brewery side of it is normally such a high profit center for the labor costs, even with the material costs in a brew pub, because you're getting full pint dollar, you know, versus selling it packaging it in cans mm -hmm. or bottles and selling it out into the trade. Your, yeah. your profit margin in a brew pub is so high yeah. that I don't know why the restaurant tours in Puerto Rico are not just going out and saying, hmm, can I get some used equipment? How much will it cost to fill a shipping container and ship it here from wherever, Florida, Texas? I mean, honestly, with COVID going on and the pandemic, there will be some breweries turning over and there will become some equipment available. Yeah. And, um, you know, if these restaurant owners don't know, don't understand the brewing side of it, they have you guys as resources and you guys have connections and you know, people, you know, people who have the skill sets. For one thing, you know, people in the United States like myself that you could email and say, I got some questions. Do you mind answering? I got five questions or something. You know, and, and you can get the help. That's the beauty of this industry is that people are so um, just so open hearted and mm -hmm. open minded and accommodating and willing to help. And the camaraderie and the brotherhood and sisterhood in the beer industry is unlike any other industry I've ever seen anywhere. And, um, you know, the, even people that are bitter enemies not enemies, bitter competitors, yeah, competitors are not enemies. They are not enemies. Now, what's funny is when I first started in this industry, way back in 1988, when I attended brewing school, there were about 50 big breweries and about 50 craft breweries. In the big breweries, if you work for a big brewery and you went out with your pals to play pool or something, let's say you went to a brewing class and everybody was from all different breweries, they always bought their own beer. And I said, why do you buy your own mm -hmm. beer? You're not learning anything. You need to buy your competitors' beers and people you don't compete with buy their yeah. beers too. And they said, if I am photographed with someone else's beer in my hand, I will be fired. And that is a mistake. 
And that so is, if it's yeah. so backwards, if that's still happening, it needs to stop because you cannot learn if all you taste is your own thing. You know, if I make chili one way and somebody else makes chili uh, a different way, how am I going to learn if all I ever taste is my chili? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a, in a music industry, it's like a, if I have a band, I'm going to listen only to my, my band. Like, that would uh, be crazy. Uh, that would be crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah <laughs> boring. <laughs> it would be boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if any breweries in Puerto Rico are of that mindset that, that we only drink our own beer and if we're photographed with someone else's bottle, we're going to get fired, that needs to be cleared up right away. You are a dinosaur. You will not learn if you do that. And so get that going on and then um, taste everything. I mean, if there's a beer you've never had that style and you're like, ew, sour. I don't like sour things. I'm afraid to try it. I'm like, well, you wimp. Just do it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> how are you going to learn? In an unbranded glass. And <laughs> yeah. How, time, how, I mean, how are you going to learn? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, broaden, broaden your mind, broaden your taste buds, broaden your expertise, your understanding, and talk about it, communicate about it. Make pen pals. Remember pen pals? Yeah, pen, pen pals. pals. Make pen pals. Beer industry pen pals in the United States. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm kind of a pen pal for most women in the beer industry. Women will <laughs> randomly contact me and, you know, I will do my best to respond. I mean, I can't just get a deluge because I still have a day job, you know. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of people are so afraid of annoying someone or uh, intruding on their privacy that they just say no. They're too afraid to reach out. But I'm giving you permission. If you have a question and you have a dream, reach out and make a connection because um, your dream is worth it. Yeah, it's Especially like that. Especially if you're in Puerto Rico yeah. because they don't have enough proofs yet. <laughs> it's like that. We have this show. We, 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 we have this show that we happen to make it out of boredness. Uh, we are we are bored in the pandemic, and uh, we have the lockdown. Uh, we made this little show, it's like a three of three, the three of us uh, tasting um, uh, our beers because we are home brewers. And they this is this thing is go big, go big. And Jorge is the one that is it's like a what if we if if we write to this person and go to our show it's like uh <laughs> i don't know man i don't know we they, they don't know us uh, we are nobody yeah, you have to just go yeah. for it and this people guy like make yourself it. i yeah. mean yeah i was a nobody in 1988 i was a home brewer who had been home brewing three years i home brewed five batches a year that's 15 homebrew batches under my belt and they were all extract and i attended the American Homebrewers Association Homebrew Con, and that was at the time held at the same same time as the um, as the uh, Great American Beer Festival. And I met Charlie Papazian. Ah. And I met Michael Jackson. Ooh, and Michael I, Jackson. I, I met yes. Greg Noonan from the Vermont Pub and Brewery, who is who is T Tommy Noonan's uncle. I don't know if you heard of Greg Noonan. Um, I met uh, John Meyer, who just retired from. Uh, the Rogue Brewing Company. I met all these people and I asked them questions and I was just a home brewer and yeah. they were hanging out and they were fine. You know, beer is the great equalizer. It's a social lubricant. Mm -hmm. It opens your <laughs> mouth and it opens your ears. So use it. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the questions we had a uh... You know, part of the show was like, what advice would you give to somebody going from home brewing to going pro? And you just hit a grand yeah, slam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so. let's, I can think of more. Let me think here for a <laughs> second. Um, if you're a home brewer and you're passionate about brewing, the first thing you got to do is um, figure out if you want to be a brewer and, or an owner. Um, or that's one of the things you need to do. There's a lot of things you need to do. Um, but figure out if you want to be a brewer or an owner, because I've seen a lot of people open breweries because they want to brew, but it's, it's they're kind of diametrically opposed on time because you just don't have the time. So if you want to own a brewery, there's a very good chance you're not going to be brewing. 
Um, I have never owned a brewery uh, because I like brewing. <laughs> and so, um, but if you really, really want to just stay on the creative side of things, be okay with not being an owner, you know? Right. And, but make yourself so valuable that um, like always, you know, you can get bored, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe, but believe it or not that you work in the same <laughs> brew pub for many years, you can get bored because you've done it all there a, a million times. So it, keep expanding your skill set. Do collaboration brews with other brewers to expand your brewing knowledge. Um, take on styles you never did. I started brewing so long ago that the first India Pale Ale, commercial India Pale Ale I ever tried was mine because there were none. So I had to brew it myself. So I did the research. I said, okay, it's a British style from this point in history. Went to India, had this kind of malts in it, Munich's and Vienna malts, had these types of hops, hmm, Styrian Goldings, uh, that mm -hmm. gives it an orange marmalade flavor. And I decided, you know, um, at the time, this is way back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, all my brewing friends that were home brewers going pro, they were using imported ingredients. Well, the first brewery I went to work for went out of business in two months. And, oh. um, and so I thought, well, and they bounced two out of four. So 50% of my paychecks got bounced, which means oh. they, there was no money. And so it was, it was terrible. And so um, when, when I went to my next, when I got my next brewing job, I made a mental decision that I was going to use the most local ingredients I could find. Now, this was back in 1988, so way ahead of the locavore movement. And my friends, my, my friends would really like beat up on me and they'd say, you can't make an India pale ale with American ingredients. That's a British style. You have to use British malts and British hops <laughs> and British yeast. I said, is your yeast coming from Great Britain? No, it's, it's made in America. Yep. And I said, are you importing your water? No, but I'm adding brewing salts. I said, it's not really a British beer. You got American yeast, even if it's a British style, you got American water, you're adding brewing salts. I said, I'm gonna try to replicate those flavors with American ingredients. So they have Munich and Vienna malts made in the United States, made in the West Coast where I work. So Great Western makes a Munich, makes a Vienna. I said, and I said, and the hops, there you have to use British hops. I said, it has orange marmalade flavor. I said, guess what I'm finding? I'm finding citrus, grapefruit types of flavors in American hops. They're like, you can't do that. I said, yes, I will. Okay. And you know what? <laughs> Maybe my brewing friends at the time were not impressed, but the customers who bought my beer loved my grapefruit pineapple IPA, right? I mean, there was no fruit in it. This all came from mm -hmm. the hops. Right. And now everybody is making American IPAs. And in fact, in Europe, they're called IPAs, IPA, IPA. And, <laughs> and they're importing American hops to try to get the American yeah. flavors yep. in Europe because they're trying to make American IPAs. So we really started something. And in fact, another first, um, I believe that my American India Pale Ale called Bombay Bomber was the first American style India Pale Ale on draft 100% of the time as a standard offering as a brew pub starting in January of 1991. Wow. And so wow. now, now everybody is making American IPAs mm -hmm. all over the world. But, you know, um, wh where am I going with this? I don't know. I, you know me, I kind of like <laughs> that, right? It's all about stories. So, the only uh, so advice. So we're, we're looking for advice. So we're looking happens. for advice. So don't be afraid to experiment. So if you're like, I really want to make an American IPA, but those citrus hops are so expensive. Well, Puerto Rico grows citrus fruits. Figure out how to like grate some zest, buy some zest from a guy that has a grating machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, something, you know, you're looking to replicate flavors. You're not looking to buy expensive imported ingredients. Mm -hmm. So what else is Puerto Rico famous for? Tell me some some produce, some things that Puerto Rico is famous for. Probably oh, yeah. fish, right? Good coffee. Fish. Coffee. <laughs> coffee. Okay, cool. That's a cool idea. Oh, coffee. Yeah. Okay, what else? Uh, chocolate. Uh, we have a, a new industry that's growing, the cacao. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have rum. 
Of course, yeah, rum. Rum, rum. But rum, rum mm -hmm. uses so. does does rum use? Okay, that uses sugar cane. Um, yeah. So sugar cane could be an ingredient as well. And then, what does rum really get its flavors from? Does it get it from sugar cane or the barrels or from spices? Uh, we have uh, uh, maybe it's from barrels, but mm -hmm. mostly it's for the the sugar cane. The sugar cane. Yeah. So so looking at your future indigenous Puerto Rican beer lineup, and we're hoping there's going to be more than one style of beer that's going to be native to Puerto Rico, that then the rest of the world is going to want to import that flavor is going to be sugar cane. That's going to be an important ingredient because you're going to want to capture that flavor. So how do you capture the flavor of sugar cane similar to what they get in rum in a beer? Your homebrewers need to be working on that recipe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have an assignment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And then for coffee. Have... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no it's okay. Okay. So for, so, co so for coffee, most people think of coffee black, right? Roasted. And they think of coffee uh, beers as being porters and stouts. But your weather's very hot. So you can't drink a ton of super dark beers all year round. Mm -hmm. But have you heard of blonde stouts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we have. Where, yeah, where we, 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 made, we made a, a few of those. You yeah. did. Coffee, yeah. coffee beans that are uncrushed, right? Yeah. Roast, roasted but uncrushed, is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so you uh, Maybe the, the same fruit have the... If you take out the fruit, and you have the beans, right? Right. But the, but the, the, the fruit itself, yeah, the, uh, pulp. the pulp of the fruit, taste is, the taste is like uh, guava, but doesn't have that a specific strong guava flavor, but have like a, maybe a hint of guava. But nice. it's a very refreshing fruit. Oh, I uh, love it. What is that called? Is there a name uh, for it? If you, if, you, if you try that, it's called cascara. Casca? Ca cascara. That part Cas of the cascara. Fruit. Cascara. The cascara. cascara. So, yeah. you, so you guys are, need to be making cascara lagers or something. Not, yeah. Um, uh, honestly, you're probably going to have to start with ales to start because those beers turn over faster. And, and your breweries are only going to be able to afford so many pieces of stainless steel tanks. And so I call that tank rent. How long does a beer stay in that tank? If yeah. you can keep it to two weeks instead of four or six weeks, like with a lager, you can turn over that beer and make mm -hmm. more money. So, so your new startups are going to have to make ales. They're going to have to make them very neutral or tropical, probably um, not heavy on, you know, I mean, not sulfur like lagers, but they're going to need to make them very light and drinkable just because you guys are, are in the tropics, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. You're going to need to have a custom. What about Kavik? Kavik, yeah. I, I was yeah. just going to mention yeah. that, that something new in the, fairly yeah. new in the industry and in the home brewing community. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the oldest thing. I, I'm not even sure when <laughs> Kavik was, was first. Uh, yeah. It I came from the, way, right? and the, and the, the gist come from the, from the coldest part of the, of the Europe. Like, yeah. uh, but but it, it, you can use it here because it's the perfect gist. Yeah, you, can, you read the you read the like the description and the the way you can use it, and it's like this is freaking Puerto Rican yeast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like oh, so yeah. great for 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 the, for the temperature here in the, in the swings. And and I yeah. tried a couple of uh, Arturos made some really good mm -hmm. IPAs with Quebec, and you try them, and it's super clean, no esters, no wild you know fusels or anything. It's just like a super clean hoppy and it's still an ale and it turns around that thing ferments like crazy. three days yeah three days. Three days. yeah it's like three days yeah. well, you can get it in a keg in a week or a week and a half yeah so that's that that's what you guys are going to need because your breweries i mean i'm sure stainless is imported it's expensive on an island your real estate's <clears> probably expensive so you're going to need to turn that ta those tanks over fast your take rent has to be as minimized you guys Probably all I need to go to like Quebec yeast. You got to be bringing in your, uh, oh God, uh, whatever those coffee flesh is. <laughs> I don't remember uh, what cascara. you said. Cascara. 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 What a great word. Literally means cascara sounds feel. like a dance. Cascara. <laughs> <That's> cascara. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you want I, to go I, Costco I eat that, tonight? Actually, I ate from cacao once in my life. I'm not even sure if I remember how it tastes, but I got to try that. Like the cacao I would fruit, say, yes, like, yes. Kavikis, uh, cascara, um, uh, uncrushed roasted coffee beans. Um, you're going to need to go with some light body. Um, citrus fruit, citrus pith. I mean, you guys have resources. You just haven't, like, you got to take, this is the thing about innovation, right? I'm the malt innovation center manager at Great Western Malting. So I think about innovation. And so what they say about innovation is we take this established thing here and this established thing here that have never come together and you put them together. And that is innovation mm -hmm. because people can understand this and they can understand this and you put them together and they get it. They can figure out how to put them together. So you guys, my goal and my dream for Puerto Rico is that you guys become the most innovative island brewing scene in the world and you are using native stuff and you are working with your restrictions of importation expenses yeah. and your taxes and, and your warm weather and all of that and your resources, your resources are rich. And so you guys are going to make this native brewing scene that is going to explode and take the world by storm in such a way. This is my goal for you. Within five years, the World Beer Cup, you've heard of it? No, yeah, of course. The yeah. Association runs it. Within five years, they will have to add categories for Puerto Rican style. Yeah, nice. The Cascada beer. They have, they, <laughs> we, they have, we, we can make uh, uh, the weather from Puerto Rico is perfect for a uh, sour, and mm -hmm. and we can use the maybe cascara. The, yeah, cascara. <laughs> yeah, we, we can cascara we can sour. make we can make a sour a goza with a salt from from our beaches or something like that. <laughs> uh, oh my god! It would be you awesome. can boil yeah. seawater. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Awesome. <laughs> so many so many ideas. Water. Yeah. There's so much potential. Yeah. I can just feel the potential. There's so much. It's going to be amazing. I, I, you know, call me back in five years. Let's do this again <laughs> in five years. And we could talk about like, like, like we could take clips of, of our dreams now and what's reality. And we're going to just keep meshing them and go, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's going to be like incredible, you guys. <clears throat> do it. I'll schedule it right now. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be really incredible. I mean, there's so much potential. I mean, oh my we God. We have to work it out. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Yep. Well, you know, you guys got a later start. So now is your time. Let's face mm -hmm. it. Portland, Oregon is like old school. We're not inventing anything new out here where I live. The new stuff is coming from you guys that are like, fresh ideas because you don't have a lot of breweries and you're trying to stand out amongst mm -hmm. the imports. How are you going to stand out? How are you going to bring in the local? And so you guys are where the innovation is coming from. Yeah, I think the innovation out. comes from the, from the necessity, uh, the necessity. And you okay. have to, I think the necessity is the, the, the biggest uh, influential thing to Always. make the, the innovations. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. That's okay. been, you guys have any more questions, any other, it's, it's, I think it's been the most educational, most yeah. uh, <laughs> interesting, I mean, I'm not going to say that because we've had a lot of really great guests, but yeah. I, I'm really, I'm, I really enjoyed it. This has been yeah. like a master class uh, for, for, for brewing in general, for, for just living your life, like, I really, I admire everything you've done and Thank thanks, you. thanks a lot for, for your time. Thanks, thanks, Terry, for, for, for your time. I'm yeah. honored to sure. have you here. Something else you want to definitely say to the yeah, people. Yeah, when you guys people. start making the cascara beer, I want you to send <laughs> me some. Oh, we'll, yeah. send, we'll, we'll <laughs> ship a box directly to you first. Yeah, I, I mean, I see, I see so much potential. I'm like, my mouth is watering with the ideas. You know how that goes, right? <laughs> yeah. so it's yeah. like, oh, why is it there all? It's going to happen. It's going to happen because. Sometimes you have to put the idea into the universe like a cloud and then the ideas rain on everyone and someone is going to get wet and they're going to manifest it. That so nice. we just made the cloud. Perfect. That's awesome. 
And if you're ever in Puerto Rico, like, like we were call. talking yeah. about, please yeah. send them <laughs> a <email> or <laughs> that, I sure will. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks so much, you guys. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Terry. Thank, thank you, Terry. How do you say cheers in Puerto Rico? Salud. 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 <laughs> Hasta la próxima, amigos. Aquí en Breaking News, Milan Coffee. Salud y pesetas. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry.